start with a question. Here's the thing. Do you know that 90% of an influencer's success is down to his or her um, personality? And on today's show in the Toilet Paper Diaries, you'll discover how to shape your online personality in a way that viewers will fall in love with you and want to spend quality time with you and want to find out where you live and possibly stalk you and you'll wake up and they're in your house. Um, so we're going to be broadcasting live all the way from Dubai and uh, Houston, and this is what we're going to be talking about. True? That is correct. And uh, if you cool. just joined us, please um, support us by sharing this video with uh, all your entrepreneur friends, all your speaker friends, because what we're going to be covering is super good. And if you're watching in YouTube, please make sure to support us by signing up and subscribing to our um, channel and also making sure that the bell is there because what we con what the content that we share every week is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to share with you today was how crazy uh, this whole thing started. I mean, we started the Toilet Paper Diaries in um, about 92 days ago. And uh, he and uh, yeah, Davis, Davis lost there. I'm not sure what's going on with him. But anyway, he will be returning in a moment. So we got started about 90, 92 days ago. We didn't really know exactly how, what, what we were doing. And uh, what happened was that uh, little by little, we started really falling into understanding how this whole thing of broadcasting was. So today's topic is your virtual personality. And uh, Dave and I... We also had to struggle in how we were going to create this virtual personality. And I think what you're going to learn today is going to be very interesting. But the first thing that I want you to do is, while we get here, let's just watch how all this got started and how we understood that this was something that we also needed to do. Have a look. And officials, normally when we do this, we rehearse these jokes right. in front of a, a, a rehearsal audience. But today, obviously, there's no audience. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, just bear that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know already. But that was Jimmy's last show for a few weeks as it's been confirmed that The Tonight Show, along with The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and Late Night with Seth Meyers, is suspending production. The Tonight Show released this statement. We've been monitoring the current situation here in New York and the safety of our staff, crew, guests, and our studio audiences are our number one priority. For that reason, we've decided that we will not tape any new shows effective Friday, March 13th. The Tonight Show is planning on resuming a normal taping schedule on March 13th. Now, for the first time ever, Stephen Colbert hosted The Late Show without a studio audience, and it turns out that they ended up airing the rehearsal show where he was just having a blast drinking bourbon. Have you had any of this? Because <laughs> I have, and I gotta tell you, I feel like a child again. This is rehearsal, but I'm thinking this is what we actually show people. Sure. Uh-oh. <laughs> They're gonna be really surprised when I walk out of the building in a half an hour. <laughs> Although Colbert admitted that he was basically winging it, he landed some pretty funny jokes, especially when he got passionate about Tom Hanks and the coronavirus. Hey, coronavirus. Okay, yeah, you could shut down Italy. You could shut down South Korea. You could destroy our economy, but keep your filthy nucleocapsid proteins off Tom Hanks. The man is an American treasure. This is like learning that Liberty Bell has herpes. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna, it ends now! I'm used to doing a show without a television audience, <laughs> but normally there's an audience here in the studio, uh, but we're, we're not going to be doing that, and we're going to see how that plays out, and um, we love you so much, and we're going to be here every night trying to make you laugh and trying to bring a bit of light and levity to your day whenever we can. James Corden let his audience know that The Late Late Show will continue to tape next week, but without a studio audience. Over on The Daily Show, Trevor Noah sang a tribute song to his studio audience after the show announced beginning on Monday, they'll also record without an audience. I'm gonna miss those guys who love to explain the it's show. It's funny because Trump is dumb. The people with the weird ass laughs are the ones I'll miss the most. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who came to kill me But then I want him over with my jokes The fans who came from Africa And just wanted to hear about home <laughs> Tell them about Uganda No one knows about Uganda, man, but I'm gonna miss you It's time for quarantine, y'all I can't wait till this is over and the virus is beat And all your asses 
I'm back in those seats. I love you guys. What is the difference between doing a live presentation and uh, having a real audience? In reality, this is the same thing that happened to all the big guys. I mean, uh, from Ellen DeGeneres to uh, Jimmy Kimmel to uh, Stephen Colbert to absolutely everything and that everybody and everybody had to develop their own personality. In fact, if you see them right now in their uh, in their homes and if you see them uh, in their sh real show, they're completely different. They had to also develop their uh, personality. And this is exactly what we uh, need to do. And one of the things which is very difficult to understand for most people is that whenever you have an audience, you have a reply. And then, of course, they are talking to you and you have a connection with them. But when you're talking right now to the camera, as I am doing right now, even if I take off my glasses, I am connecting with you and I am connecting with you and I am connecting with you. But in reality, I am not. I am just over here and <laughs> I have to use my glasses because if not, I cannot see what's going on there on the uh, uh, on the screen. But uh, this is what this whole show is going to be about, how we are going to be really learning how to create our own uh, virtual personality, because that is super powerful for anybody. Right now, I was just recently invited to an event that is called the Digital uh, CEO, and it doesn't matter if you have a business, it doesn't matter what you're doing, uh, you need to learn how to transmit your personality through a camera and you don't have to be it's not that you're super funny and it's not that you're super crazy but in reality what it is is that you need to understand how this virtual environment uh, works and i think that is what you are going to find uh, super super interesting now this is also something very funny when we got started with the toilet paper diaries we really have no idea how and where in which direction we were uh, going. So let me just uh, share with you one video of us on the first episode of uh, the Toilet Paper Diaries. Have a look. Ladies and gentlemen, live from Houston and Dubai, we bring you the Toilet Paper Diaries with Ernesto Verdugo and Dave Crane. Uh, how are you doing, Ernesto? Hi, Dave. How are you? Great to see you. Uh, and our first episode of the uh, Toilet Paper Diaries. Absolutely. The name was was put together because of all the chaos when people were shopping to buy as much as possible and everyone was buying tons of toilet paper, tons of milk, tons of just stuff which didn't make sense because, okay, it might not keep, but why would you want all that much? But anyway, that's what we just thought was a, was a concept for putting the show together. By the way, this is a show which is intended uh, to support entrepreneurs, to support as speakers to support experts so that they know what's going uh, what's going on and how you can actually uh, get yourself prepared and how you have to think so that um, uh, your business will keep on going in the uh, positive direction so i think this is just a, a reinvention and we just have to do it that way <laughs> Here's the thing. I think that, uh, sorry, can I just show you my dog down here? She's just, oh, she's going now. Yes, yeah, stage fright. I think the difference between when we first started and what we're doing right now is at least I was upstairs. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm in a different part of the house. I think when we first started, we weren't sure what we were doing. Now, apart from technical hitches, we've got a direction. I think also we had to, even though we've been friends for 20 years, we had to sort of guest work around each other's pauses and what the other person was thinking. And now we can always finish off each other's sentences. I think another change that's happened, and we sort of discussed this before, is when we first started the show, it was all about how to deal with the lockdown. Now the lockdown has lifted in many places. For you and me, we've got a sort of self-imposed lockdown, which is a different dynamic. So um, as far as our own personalities go, we brought a lot to the table before we started, but now we've got to find out how who we are now still has an appeal for the people that are watching. I think that's a challenge, but it's also interesting at the same time. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, right now, what we're gonna be doing today and uh, this full week is we're gonna be showing you how we actually created the uh, toilet paper diaries, how we actually grown up our uh, online personalities and uh, how we actually <laughs> learned to leave some of these challenges of not, not uh, uh, appearing there. So make sure to 
uh, supporters this whole week, uh, go to toiletpaperdiaries.com and uh, make sure to, to listen to the uh, previous episodes. It's just quite interesting. It is really for speakers, for business owners, for everybody, just to see how we have actually really grown throughout uh, these days. So, Dave, um, it seems like a complete life ago that we uh, recorded all of these all, all of these episodes. What is what you think right now that we has uh, we have changed? Because we were just having a conversation uh, a moment ago on uh, right now the broth, and that was actually the um, uh, the example that I was sharing with you, the broth in which we are cooking is completely different. It is. It uh, is. We are not talking about how to bake bread, and we're not talking about the crazy things that we were doing in lockdown. Right now, we are in a complete different environment. And uh, right now, everybody has to figure out, well, you know, okay, now everybody's coming out. What would be your advice on how to uh, come out and uh, be more visual? on the internet with what's going on right now? I think the biggest challenge for everybody is asking the question, what's in it for them? Which is what you should ask in business, you should ask in any kind of live audience situation. What's in it for your audience? They've been in lockdown for a while, they're coming out now, and you're also up against the fact they want to stay, with, they meet their friends and go out to, for a meal and a coffee. They're now shopping, they're doing stuff that they hadn't done before. Whether it's too early or not is a separate conversation. Which is the gap that you're going to fill with the content that you're creating for people? And what's the new relationship you want with people? Because if you and I still carry on talking about lockdown, the entire world's going to say, why don't you walk out of the house? You don't have to be there. So it's not a tone that we can use, but it was obviously all in it together before. So you have to work out the new version of you. And I know that's a big challenge for many of the guys who are doing late night TV shows because they're still in kind of self-imposed lockdown because they don't have to be there, but they can't have an audience in the, in the room. So are they going to go back to their set where they can have distanced staff but not have anybody physically come in. It's easier from a production point of view to stay where they are. And I think for the next two to three months, that's exactly where they're gonna be. Yeah, so would you guys like to know how to develop your own uh, personality online so that you can actually come across, that you can actually overcome some of the challenges that we were overcoming on this show, that Today. suddenly my co-hosts went missing and uh, suddenly, I mean, there was this panic of, well, my goodness, what are we going to do? And still that people watch you, even though that you're making mistakes, even though that you're doing th uh, funny things and how you can actually jump so that people will love you. Uh, who is your favorite late night show host? Okay, I... I, I enjoy most of them, to be honest with you. I mean, because we spent a lot of time watching them because we had no choice. So I love Trevor Noah because he's different and because not only is he funny and in, uh, insightful, but he also does these spin-offs where he talks about life from the way that he sees it, which aren't particularly funny, but they're really in-depth. I love seeing Seth Meyers because I think his monologues are spectacular and I love the tone that he has. Uh, and also the master of it all for me is Stephen Colbert who just comes on like a chat show host should come on wherever he is and improvises and he's an incredibly talented guy between his singing and his dancing and all the rest of it. So those are the ones that grab me, but all of them are contributing in some way. I've watched them all every day for three months. Yeah, I have, I have been doing the same. If you're watching right now live, let us know who your favorite uh, late night show host is. Mine, very similarly, I, th uh, I think my... my uh, Favorite right now, it's between Jimmy Kimmel and uh, Trevor Noah. Uh, I like also watching uh, Stephen Colbert. And I like studying uh, Stephen Colbert because, of course, he is not, you know, he really looks like, a, a, he looks a little bit like a geek. And uh, <laughs> you never expect that he's going to be the one that is going to be the most humorous. But one of the things that I really like is that his humor is very formulaic. I mean, just think about it. I am not... Mr. Uh, fast reaction reactor. I mean, I have I am speaking a, a third language when I'm speaking in English with you. I have an accent, and uh, sometimes whatever I say is not going to come out difficult. So it's going to not going to out perfect, as I was just saying. <laughs> so here's the important thing: is even if you are not perfect, even if you do not know exactly how things go, uh, and if you're not the fast 
uh, thinking in your feet. If you follow Stephen Colbert's formula, you're going to find this a lot easier to do. So let's just have a look at the first. We're going to be learning three strategies from Stephen Colbert on how he creates his comedy. And this is one of those things that you're going to find very useful. Have a look. Stephen Colbert is one of the most popular comedians on television today, and it is largely due to his ability to think on his feet and make people laugh. Today we're going to talk about three go-to jokes that form the foundation of Colbert's humor. Once you learn these, jokes will start to come to you on the fly and you'll have people cracking up without even trying. I tell him you're in, you're trapped oh. in the wrong body. Poor him. Yeah, he is. Because <laughs> I'm a nerd, I'm a nerd trapped in the right body. We're very excited, Deadpool, the whole thing. I am, I'm excited that I have more than one suit. <laughs> The first go-to joke Colbert uses is the fake out. The idea is to set up expectations going one way and then say something that goes the other way. Obviously, did you see him the other night? That guy is on fire. He is on a rocket ride to plausible <laughs> at this point. Did you watch? I did, it was a strong yeah. debate. What was it like? I didn't see Surprise. it. Surprise. I didn't see it. <laughs> Your new book is America Again, Rebecoming the Greatness We Never Weren't. That's right. <laughs> Which makes no sense. Well, of course it does, of course it does because America, America is perfect. Right. And we have to fix it. <laughs> it seems simple because it is simple. That's the beauty of it and is why Steven can come up with his jokes so quickly. Watch Letterman's reaction to this in the next clip. You don't like the new pope? I don't like the new pope. Because I, he I, wouldn't I, meet you. Well, that and he's not as doctrinaire as I would hope. He's not into judgment, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it, you know. He clearly was not expecting that, and the absurdity of it has him in stitches. Now, Steven has the benefit of years of experience in improv comedy, but that formula he just laid out, you can practically steal verbatim. If you want to build this habit, just wait until the next time you're about to say you like something. Then instead, say you don't like it, and then list its positive qualities. It may feel clunky at first, but you will very quickly find it becomes natural, and you'll start to crack up everyone around you. It can be as easy as one sentence to set expectations and one to say the unexpected. I'm, I said no gotcha questions. I promise you no gotcha questions, yep. but I'm gonna lead Fire with away. one. Go ahead. If you want to get good at this type of humor, simply get in the habit of asking yourself, what are people expecting me to say in this situation? And then say the opposite. You know, his mother was Scottish. I heard that, yeah. Well, that's, that's the problem right there. <laughs> can I say that in CBS now? Oh yeah, you can say, you can say all you want on CBS now. He's a master. I love Stephen Colbert. The thing is, every time you watch him, he, he, can, he can bond with every single guest he gets on the show. He can dance with them and flirt with them as a, as a TV show host, but then bring it back to what he needs to do next. But nobody, it doesn't matter who the personality is that he has on the show with him, they don't feel that they're left out. They always feel included in his jokes, which is brilliant. Yeah. He does that so well. Yeah, well, the, this strategy I love because, I mean, we, I, I practice it all the time. I mean, I try to do it all the time, and I know it's very easy to practice. Just basically, you build the expectations to something, and then you completely change it around, and that makes people crack up. Now, out of the two of us, you are the funny guy. I mean, you are the one that has the great sense of humor and uh, you do it fantastically on the stage, everywhere. And I mean, it's always a joy to have you around. But the problem is many people don't really know how to uh, use humor. Would you really recommend for people to actually start using humor, even if they're not funny or they don't feel that they're no, funny? Don't do it. I'd say one of the things I discovered about, about humor is when you're good at doing it, then that's cool. And I've had humor for my entire life because it's a, been a, a survival technique for me to be able to, because I can't fight people because I'm too short and fat, but I can make them laugh. So it's just easier to do it like that. I found and discovered that if you want to get an audience to warm to you, be warm, not funny. Because if you're funny, you might get it right, you might get it wrong, but then you feel the need to become a stand-up comedian and constantly top each joke. And having hosted comedy nights, it's really difficult to do a joke that doesn't fall flat when you're expected to be at the peak of it. What I would always suggest is be warm because the, the relationship it has with an audience is the same as being funny. People enjoy your company. And then when you do throw a joke in, it always falls really well because they weren't expecting it.
I do a lot of humor. Sometimes it's misplaced and sometimes it's tumbleweed going across in front of me, but I just keep going anyway because I find it funny even if nobody else does. Yeah, what I liked about this strategy is just that basically if you train yourself and you don't have to do it on stage or on the camera, but by you train yourself to build the expectations and then suddenly change it, that always makes a, that always grabs a laugh. So before you're actually doing it there, do it uh, not, <laughs> not not online, but it's all it's also quite a lot of fun. Now here's uh, the second strategy from uh, Stephen Colbert. I think this one also it's uh, super funny, a little bit more difficult to implement, but you're going to find it also very funny. Have a look. The second go-to joke Colbert uses is the caricature. Watch it in this next clip and notice how he changes his voice to create a character. We've got everything in the world. We've got mountains, they've, they, they've got valleys. The land is so raw, volcanoes. Mm -hmm. You feel like when you go, there's a, there's a deep feeling that if I moved here, if I just stayed, I would be a man. <laughs> it feels very, it feels very raw. Yeah. yeah. Now imagine if he hadn't changed his pacing and his tone and he had simply said, there's a sense that if I just stayed here, I would be a man. You'd know how he felt about New Zealand but it wouldn't have gotten a laugh. But by slowing his pacing slightly and taking on the caricature of the manly man, he captures the audience's attention and makes them laugh. Steven made his career out of this for a long time, playing a character that shared his name and face, but not his views or mannerisms. In this next clip, watch him switch between the two and listen for how you notice when he's in character. When people invite me to do things, uh, I don't, don't always know who they've invited me or the guy on the television show. So who, who are you? This is me. This is me. What do you want to know about him, Father? I Who's asking know. and why? I'm okay? asking. This is Just because you got the dog collar on doesn't <laughs> mean you know more about the Catholic Church than I do. Do you understand me? Are You're, we clear on that? I, <laughs> saint Basil? Saint Basil. I'm no fan. Okay? <laughs> why? Saint Arugula. That's the saint. Saint Arugula. That's the saint, that's the saint I worship. If you want to experiment with this type of humor, you don't have to invent the over-the-top character ahead of time. Just wait until the next time you naturally find yourself telling a story and make it a point to try to embody the different characters involved as you tell it. In this next clip, Steven shows us three things we can play with to embody a character. Voice, body language, and the speed at which you speak or move. But it would be different. It would be... But he's like, go improvise about, you know... Derivatives and... and really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Generalized debt obligations. Make it exciting. Go. <laughs> exactly. And the characters don't even have to be the punchline. Here's an example of Steven showing you how you can take on characters much more subtly, not to get a laugh, but just to set the scene and captivate attention. Just for context, he was doing a shoot for The Daily Show at a KKK rally, and some KKK members saw them doing it and approached them. Notice how he creates a slightly different voice for himself, his female producer, and the KKK members. Somebody goes, what's this comedy thing? Are you making fun of the Klan? And she goes, look, guys, the president of the Klan's over there across the field. He knows all about what we're doing. Go talk to him. And they said, we're going to. And they all walk off across the field. <laughs> and she goes, haul ass! <laughs> It isn't a huge difference. He doesn't go fully into character, but it helps him keep your attention and makes him more interesting to listen to. Very intuitive. And you've got to know your audience. You've got to know what you can get away with and the parameters and your own skill sets because you can drop badly getting an accent wrong and impersonation wrong. So you've got to get it just right, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know one of the things that I always makes me, brings a big smile to my face is uh, uh, our good friend, uh, Frank Mulcahy, he's, uh, he's from Boston. And I remember the time that you guys met and uh, we were here in the States and uh, we were here in Houston. And uh, suddenly he approached to you and he said to you that uh, he was, he. I mean, that if you could actually tell where his accent was from. Yeah. And I remember that you were just like, well, you know, I mean, it's you're from America. <laughs> because of course, they, we was expecting that you will know all the accents from everywhere. So this yeah. is what I was going to ask. How, I mean, just... How would you tell that story? Because it's actually a very... Uh, well, you put me on the spot with it because I'm rubbish at accents. I can't do any accents. I can barely do mine. And so Frank, I love to bits. He's a very dear friend of ours. And he came up to me and it was the first time we'd met and he knew that I was British. Uh, and so he knew he wanted to share with me, you know, that he's from somewhere else as well. So he said, hey, can you guess where my ex is from? And I went, America. He went, no. <laughs> I went, um, and I'm trying to go through places I know in America. And he goes, Boston, Boston. <laughs> and listen, I went, you know what? You're absolutely right. And I didn't know what a Boston accent sounded like. I only know Boston accents now sound like Frank. So every time he says something, I know it's Frank Mulcahy 
from Boston. And he's a sweetheart. I'm not great at picking up accents, but that one I've, I've, I've got drummed into and I've remembered because I love him so much. Um, but yeah, you've got to also be careful because if you say it in the wrong company, Frank's got a great sense of humor, people can get very offended. So you've got to make sure you do it just subtly so you can be heard, but not quite enough for anyone to catch it. And uh, let's just see one more, which uh, in my eyes, it's the most difficult of them all. You can do it quite well. And actually, I'm going to put you to the test in a moment oh. just to see how well you can do it. <laughs> nice. Thank you. But this is going to be very, this is going to be an interesting one. Have a look. The third go-to joke Colbert uses is yes and. Yes and is the act of taking something someone else says, accepting it, and then building off of it. Steven shows us how to do so effortlessly. If you make this a habit of yours, people will love to be around you because you become incredibly fun to joke around with. Seriously, there is no one I would rather perform with than you. Really? Ra seriously. Really? Any to be on, but it's true. Yes and is great for multiple reasons. One reason it's great is that you don't need to invent a premise or set yourself up. You can just listen for a joke and then ask yourself one of two things, either, what's the same as that but amplified or what's the next logical conclusion if that joke were the case here's the thing yeah. don't propose to a woman on top of the eiffel tower because you want a woman who's going to settle for less that's what you want <laughs> oh. you know, that's what it's like I at the bottom of a mine shaft <laughs> as far away <laughs> as right. you can get that and it can create a great back and forth if the person you're with catches on. You can crack each other up and crack up everyone around you. Listen in this clip how Craig Ferguson throws out two random subjects. Colbert combines them, and then Craig decides it would be funny to act that out. It is, it's the History Channel. Yeah, it's history. For a long time, History Channel was like Hitler, and then it was aliens. Right. Are there... That's part of our history, Stephen, whether you like it or not. Aliens and Hitler. And Hitler alien. And Hitler is... Okay. We have come from another planet. <laughs> They're building on each other. What do you think Steven does in response? Wow. Yeah? yeah that's a good Hitler yeah, alien. Yeah. That's a spooky oh, good oh, yeah. Hitler. He's just oh, kind of... Right. He doesn't mean he's like, <laughs> yes, we like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He compliments the impression and then mirrors it to join in on the fun. Not only does that two-person back and forth make everyone around you think you're hilarious, it's also incredibly fun to be a part of. And another reason that heightening someone else's joke is so great is because, as Steve Carell showed, it makes the original joker feel good because they feel listened to and like you get their humor. If you make someone feel listened to and understood and then make them laugh, that is an extremely powerful recipe for very quickly making someone like you. Ask them, they remember. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't get an empire from necessarily being nice guys. You don't. No, no. no we were, but we did it with that certain gentlemanly swagger. Right. <laughs> you did it with a gin and tonic in we one We certainly hand. did. <laughs> Bang. What's nice about these three jokes is that it's very easy for them to become habit. If you want to, you can make them second nature to you so that they just come to you on the spot. And to make it even easier on yourself, don't try to master all three at once. Just pick one to focus on at a time. That way, instead of your brain having to spin through multiple options, you know immediately whether to use a fake out, go into caricature, or build off someone else with yes and. Once you've gotten the hang of that one joke formula, then add in another. Fascinating. Love it. I love it. Breaking down how Colbert does it. So on this one, we, we work on it very much. I mean, I remember Michael Dietrich, which is uh, uh, our friend you have seen him many times here in the paper, uh, Toilet Paper Diaries. But when we were here in Houston doing uh, Speak in America, he was actually teaching all the audience how to do the yes and. And we feed on each other very nicely on that. I mean, I can start a, a story and then I throw it to you and then you can continue that story and then you can continue that story. I mean, we con we continue the story. And that's why that's why you see that working together. It's just a, it's just a great, great thing. So I hope uh, I hope that you guys find this uh, very, uh, very valuable. <laughs> but one of the things you've got to do, Ernesto, whenever and you see it on the on these shows of Colbert and so on. They have to make a decision that working together will give a great result. So they won't try and top each other without the consensus that they will try and top each other. So when you've got a guy like um, Stephen Colbert and John Oliver, who are both clearly capable of anchoring their own show, they will try and get a joke over on each other, but then they'll settle, then go back in again. When you've got the dynamic wrong, and that sometimes happens, you have a massive clash, and then they try and pick it up again, and sometimes it falls so flat, you can tell it's just gone dead between the whole people. And you can feel it, it's tangible. You can tell when it's something that hasn't worked out because the audience is going, ooh. And one of the best people at producing that is somebody like um, Ricky Gervais with The Office. 
because he would say things that were so bad taste and so out of order. And it's very British humour. It would go dry and you go, oh, should we be laughing? I'm not sure. And he won Emmy after Emmy after Emmy by getting that perfectly right. And uh, yeah. a lot of British humour is, is perfect for doing that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. By watching what the uh, masters in, um, in Late Night are doing, at least I have been learning a lot on how to develop my own personality when I am actually doing these shows. I mean, Dave, for you, it comes a lot more easy because, I mean, you have been doing radio um, in, the, uh, in, in your past life. <laughs> yeah, so what would be other tips that you can share so that people can actually start developing their own uh, digital personality? Well, radio and, and TV, and now, of course, online. I think the biggest challenge is working out what is the best version of you for the effect that you want to have. So I get interviewed a lot being on a panel for serious stuff. So, you know, what's my view on, on the business in Dubai? What's my view on, on the way that HR departments are working? And all that kind of stuff. And it's a serious subject, but it doesn't mean you have to approach it with a completely serious um, set of plans. You can talk about it, have fun with it, but also tell people that you know exactly what you're talking about so they still go, wow. And it's a very delicate balance to get because if you don't get it right, you end up looking like you trivialize the whole experience. And also, I remember one particular event I was on where I was, I was actually at a women's event. It was a ladies' empowerment, women's empowerment event. And I was the only guy in the entire room virtually. So I'm on stage and they're asking questions and we all had to answer. There's four, there's four panelists, myself being the first person, and we all gave a keynote Then we were on a panel. So the question came to me and I answered it. I thought it was a good answer. Then the question went to the next person who was an expert on life coaching. Then the next person who was a known author and the next person who was a royal. So they answered the best answers you could ever have. And then they come back to muggins, me again. So I changed the game. I turned around and I said, why are you asking me questions first? Because I'm the only guy. So you can laugh at me. Their answers are much better than mine. Can you do us a favor? Can you ask them the answers first? And then by the time it comes to me, maybe I'll have a thought of something decent that will sound okay. So everyone laughed. And we started at the other end. And by the time it came to me, I'd managed to work out something good. But the thing was, I'd taken charge of the whole thing. I'd reworked the game which is I'm not in charge, but let me be in charge for this and then I'll hand it back and then we'll play it properly. And then it could play to my advantage, which meant that I could listen to the other people's answers and come up with a better one without offending the host, which you never want to do, with having the audience still on your side and also making the other people on my panel sound good. It's that delicate balance to make everybody feel that you're not trying to steal the show and some people get it wrong as well. And then you can have laughs with it. Yeah. You know what was for me the biggest learning point that throughout these 50 episodes that we have created? Today. It was that we didn't really have to, uh, we, we didn't have to be stiff. It was okay if we made mistakes like today. I mean, we keep on making them and uh, those become bloopers. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, there's bloopers on, on uh, very serious movies. There's bloopers on everything because, of course, I mean, you are trying to, to trying to get the whole thing and then editing actually makes the whole thing ready so I, it, and and be, when the, the when the show goes live and when we edit the whole video it's a complete different story oh, I mean, we look good we look good at the edit i mean to put it in perspective this is where i'm right now i'm downstairs i'm using my wife's mac she's now somewhere else because i've stolen her mac actually i could have a look see what she's no, I'm not allowed to. I now, of course, I've got this white background. So whenever I have to do here, it's only happened before. I'm actually like one of those people who's got to hold up a number in prison and then turn it like that and turn it back again. That's what the background looks like. Considering I spent ages decorating my office to make it look good, that's what I have to deal with. So I thought I'd just share that with you. So there we go. Props. Props are good. Yeah, yeah exactly. But I mean, here the, the, um, uh, the whole thing is... If we put together, I, I, I consider this show has been a complete blooper. I mean, we're always doing bloopers. <laughs> this is a live blooper. The whole thing from start to finish has been improv, so Michael will be very proud of us. But here's the thing. All the way through, we knew that we'd have some challenges the minute that my internet dropped out and my laptop froze. We knew it, but as long as you've got your momentum going, 
people will very quickly accept that this is all we have. Are we going to stay? Are we not going to stay? If we are, then let's go for the duration. And so what you have to do is a thing called forward progression. Now, forward progression is something that's used in radio. And so forward progression is if you back announce the song that you've just heard, then people go, oh, yeah, that's what the song was. Great. OK, let's listen to something else. So you never talk about what's just gone. You talk about what's coming up all the time. And so people then will stay longer because you say, coming up, we've got a song by them, them, and I'm going to give you a chance to win $1,000. All that on the show in 10 minutes' time. So they go, oh, yeah. 10 minutes, and they stay in the car. So we're telling people all the time what's coming up. So they don't go, that was really embarrassing and, and amateur, wasn't it? And so we've got away with it so far, kind of. But you know, the funny thing is, I mean, and this is this clip you're going to love because even the super professionals, which are doing this live, they are doing the biggest bloopers. So the big learning point from you is, you know what? If you're going to be online, you're going to be doing this. Don't be stiff. I mean, just enjoy it and have a good laugh because, of course, that's going to make a big difference. Let's just have some, uh, let's just have a look at some of the bloopers that some of the pros do. Have a look. I like to eat candy corn one color at a time if you're really getting OCD you're about it. Well, I'm not always a nibbler. I'm kind of a gobbler. <laughs> I eat a lot of candy. <laughs> it's a, a sausage competition that I judge. Oh, in like sausage eating? Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah. <laughs> it's for charity, and uh, you can get uh, tickets online at Pick a Dick. Pick. Oh. <laughs> well, you're thinking about sausage. So. <laughs> Pick a Dick. And if you're making last minute dinner plans, you may have a hard time getting in some of the titties in some, in some of the city's top spots. Can I try one of these? Courtney, I would love to see my meat in your mouth. So I've got a burger ready to go Not for you. Time, I've heard that. And now for a full look at your forecast with Astrid. Maybe we can canoodle before you get into it about, um... We're not going to be canoodling. Latits. It's Lidits. Linens. <laughs> oh. Tony Abbott still needs to be erect, elect, er, elected first. Let's um, get excited about that 69. I mean, yeah. that's pretty good this time of year, isn't it? I, yeah. I know you're excited about the win, but no, 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 I want that 69. Dallas Mavericks Championship trophy was also on display this morning for fans to get an up close look at the, just the trophy, of course. Kate Winslet and Leonardo to crap. DiCaprio. One million BT customers could see their balls, uh, bills full. We're waiting to hear from Jeremy, Cump, uh, Jeremy Hunt. By and large, though, it is simply a lovely winter's day tomorrow. Bucket loads of, con of, uh, of sunshine across central and eastern areas. I feel remember last year he was dealing with a bulging dick disc issue rather in his lower back. Now let's go back to the hose. Uh, oh, that sounded terrible. Back to the hoses. Goodness gracious. Well, I won't be talking well, to the not... rose expert anymore. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but uh, you can ask me anything about peeing. I love panties. Oh, flowers. Panties. Yeah. Yes. Peonies. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Come on, Ben. Get your shit together. That's all you got? Get your stuff together. That's what I meant to say. Joining us in our studio now is the leader of Scottish Labour. Labour, sorry. Uh, Kezia Dugdale. Thanks very much for uh, being with us. California is farting. Is, is, excuse me, fighting. The police department in California is taking an unusual approach to catch porn pirates red-handed. Porch pirates, yes. Oh, off. <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> to say their final goodbyes to this fallen Louisville police officer, D.D. Mega Doo Doo. I'm sorry, Mangudu. Starting at Houghton Avenue and going all the way to State Avenue. Drivers are down to the single lane in each direction. When my son was teething, he used to like to take the big fat rubber end of my vibrating toothbrush and put it in his mouth on. Okay. And he'd just kind of sit there like, oh yeah, that feels good. That hits the spot. Hi guys, I just met her. Yeah, fantastic. She has some nice titties. Those stories and Steve McKay has more on a soggy fox, soggy forecast. Winter weather warning right now. Here's a live look at the Fox 6 snow stick. This is out on the weather dick. Sure you needed it, Annie. Did you get many spankings as a kid? Uh, as a kid? No. No, I'm, I'm, no, I wait. Wait a minute. Wait a I mean, minute. I wait a minute. One way to do a turkey call is 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 with this gobbler, and it has a little a, a little diaphragm in it that <laughs> allows the air to, to vibrate. You should try that. Okay. I would love yeah, to. Go ahead. Right. I want to see this. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> just, 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 that, just, that just wasn't right. Yeah.
I feel for every single one of those clips because I've been there and I've said it and I've got it wrong and I've got it right afterwards. And sometimes you can't do anything because it's just come out. And the thing is, because every show gets broadcast and they they, they make a, um, a recording of everything, whether it's radio or otherwise, you can go back and hear the bloopers, but you don't want to because it's just accidental. And all it takes is for you to start talking and then get distracted and then come back and then it bang, it hits you. But I do yeah. remember that my friends and I used to have a running joke where we used to do an event and uh, what we would do is we had to get a word out chosen by the team live. And you had to get it out and swallow it up into a sentence so nobody would know it was out there. And I remember one time one of the guys said it and then corpsed. Corpsing means you forget to you start laughing. So he started laughing and left that word hanging in the air. I won't say what the word was. I'll tell you when we're off air. But it was, uh, it was kind of shocking. So you have to be so careful what you can and can't get away with. Keeping it straight can be boring. Keeping it too rude can be too far. There was a guy called PJ Proby in the 70s or 60s. Obviously, I wasn't around at the time. Well, just to smile on my dad's face. And um, he went on stage one time. He was an Elvis impersonator kind of guy. Went on stage, did his song. And as he finished it, he split his trousers. And everyone started talking about it. So from that point on, every time he went on stage, he split his trousers. So maybe <laughs> sometimes it's worthwhile having that routine and getting it wrong because that's what people want to come and see. So yeah, the point here is, I mean, if you're going to be creating your virtual personality, you shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. What you should be afraid is actually looking stiff. How many times you have gone in doing a Zoom meeting and you're completely stiff and no, we are going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. And I think the big thing that uh, I have really learned to love while doing the Toilet Paper Diaries is the fact that uh, we can just really be ourselves. We know that things are going to go wrong. And it's just uh, we have to figure out how we're actually going to get them back on track. And then we have editing, which is our best friend. So it's, a, it's, it's a, actually uh, that has helped me grow tremendously. When we do the editing, we can take off these headphones and uh, maybe back upstairs again so I look better. So we'll green screen it all later in post-production. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, uh, that was it. I hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, once again, if you, if you liked what we are showing you, please make sure to support us by subscribing in uh, our uh, YouTube channel. We are always trying to give you some amazing content. And now I have a question for you. Now you know how to do live uh, television, how we basically do it. Now, would you like to know the formula on how to do YouTube videos, which is a complete different thing? I mean, when you're doing live videos and when you're recording uh, videos which are going to be shown later on in YouTube, it's a complete different animal. Is that right, Dave? Absolutely. I mean, so many things involved in going to a recorded show and you put it onto YouTube than when you're doing it spontaneous like this. But to get the two together and to deliver it so it works well on YouTube and is interesting enough to do a live takes a master. So I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Yeah, so here we go. And uh, this, is, this is a very important thing. Right now, if we want to learn from the masters, we don't have to go to the... Uh, baby boomers right now we need to go to generation c right now the one that tells me well you know who's hot and who's not is my daughter nina uh dave how uh good is maya also in selecting who are the uh the super good uh youtubers and who aren't i'll tell you how good she is i was sitting there looking through all the best YouTubers and all the best gamers. And she stood behind me, she's nine years old, and she started reeling off all the names of everybody. She was saying, oh, Mr. Beast, yeah, he's really good. And oh yeah, Dan DTM, he's brilliant as well. And she's just reeling them off. And I'm thinking, when did you watch all these things? How did you find out? But in their own world, of course, they didn't grow up watching terrestrial TV or even satellite TV. The idea of watching a whole program for more than five or maximum 10 minutes and being with the same people unless you choose to is horrific. Our idea of programming is completely different to them, but they know so much more about it as well than we do. So I, we have to learn from them, and I do, but I still can't stand watching other stuff she loves. Yeah, well, I asked Nina, and I said to her, well, you know, I am looking to uh, emulate 
one of the best YouTubers, just to know exactly the formula of how a correct YouTube should be made and how long should it last and whatever. And I mean, I just told her what I wanted. To, and then she told me, well, you know, you have to watch Amanda. I said, okay, Amanda. And then she basically shared with me this video. And on this video, we're going to basically be cutting it in uh, four pieces. So make sure to grab a pen and a paper because you're going to write down the exact formula of how to create YouTube videos that are watched. So I'm going to show you right now, Amanda, and then Dave and I are going to debrief each and every step. Have a look at step number one. Do you feel super awkward when you get on camera? Kind of like you're talking to a wall. You're not alone. A lot of people feel this way. The only way to get good on camera and to find your on-camera personality is to practice. So in this video, I'm going to be giving you guys three different ways to practice speaking out loud so that you can build confidence on camera. I'm Amanda Horvath and I'm all about helping business owners and entrepreneurs leverage the power of video without breaking the bank or taking up tons of their time. If you're looking to use video in your strategy this year, then be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified every time I release a new video. So it, it was, it was exactly 43 seconds and she basically mastered four incredible steps. So right. step number one, what was it? It was that we wanted to, we, he start, she started with a question. Then, same as Dave said, she was going to, she tell you what we were going to be doing. And then yeah. she asked you to, uh, get, to actually go and subscribe. 35 seconds, the first 35 to 40 seconds of your video, that's exactly what it needs to be. Very true. And also then she started building a relationship with you. So by the time that she said hello to you, you then accept it. And then you start traveling with her into whatever the content's going to be all the way through, which is kind of impressive. So super powerful, 35, 40 seconds, it's already set. Now let's go to video number two, have a look. Do you remember when you were first learning to drive? I don't know about you, but I was personally terrified and worried that I would never actually gain the skills to be able to drive without somebody else in the car. Even just differentiating between the brake and the accelerator was confusing. Getting on camera for the first time is very similar. You are having to learn a new skill that at first feels very unnatural but you are going to practice over and over again to where it's just gonna come naturally. So similar to when you have a permit and you're first learning to practice driving, these exercises that I'm about to walk you through are going to help you develop the skills that you need to be confident on camera. So there you go, she, she pulls a Tom Hanks. So what she doesn't affect is starts talking about things in a way that you go, oh, she's one of ours. Tom Hanks' entire career has been about playing characters that you really like, even if they're not really nice. Uh, but it just, you just feel like the every guy is there. And uh, I think she does that by telling a, a personal story, not a great story, you just warm to her. I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, and it's, it's a very simple metaphor that everybody will understand. Well, you know, I mean, have you ever felt that when you go for the, the first time to drive, everybody will go back into that story? So she goes first. She introduces her topic. She says what she's going to be talking about, starts with a question, and then she goes into the building report. This is the building report segment on it. I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's a very easy to replicate formula. So we have the first three steps. Then she builds rapport, doing, uh, uh, pulling a Tom Hanks, as Dave is saying. But it's a sales technique. It's basically saying, I am the same as you. So when yeah. you go in to see somebody, you might walk into their office and say, oh, you're, you're into fishing. That's wonderful. So I remember, let me tell you about my fishing. And all the, that was a, an old sales way of getting a relationship and getting rapport built with people by doing the stuff that they would think, oh, yeah, they might be special, but they're just like us. And some comedians and some film stars and some music musicians are always on the talk shows because when they are on, they become really nice, normal people. Not the mega stars you see on the big screen, but they identify themselves as, and it might be an act, as just being like us. And that's why we love seeing them on, on stage. People like Jennifer Lawrence, who just comes across as the sweetest person. Doesn't matter what she's like on stage, brilliant when she sees, when she's being interviewed. Exactly, so now, now what we're gonna go is we're gonna go into the uh, meat of the presentation. Have a look. Exercise number one. Talk out loud in front of a mirror. 
I know this might seem super weird to do, but I promise you it's going to feel awkward when you're in front of a camera as well. So you're starting to overcome that barrier of doing something that feels awkward, feeling confident while doing it. So just go in front of your mirror and just start talking about something. You could talk about a topic that you really enjoy, or you could just talk about some random story from your day. Exercise number two, voice record. Anytime you are driving around on the road, what I want you to do is pull out your iPhone and open the voice memo app. If you use an Android, I am sure there's an app for it that records your voice. Just open that app and hit record. It doesn't matter what you talk about, just talk. When you do this, you're going to experience the pressure of time passing. You might feel this need to perform or kind of put on a show, fill the air. You'll kind of start to notice your personal patterns that pop up. As you do this, you're gonna get more comfortable and you're gonna find that your authentic voice starts to come out and you're no longer performing for the voice memo. This is a start to finding your voice on camera and you're gonna literally be able to play it back and listen to it. Exercise number three, home tour. This time I want you to get one other person to help you. So they are going to hold up the camera and you are going to walk through your house and give a tour of the home. I want you to add personality to this. When you don't have pressure of needing to release a video, you might find that you get a little fun and crazy on camera and that's awesome because that is the extreme of your on-camera personality. When you watch back this video, you're going to see things that you do like and that you don't like. Continue developing the aspects of your personality that you do like and just kind of let go of the rest. No, go ahead. I was going to say what she was saying is, is the ability to understand what you would become if you were a broadcaster and also practicing it so you get used to not being mic or camera shy. Because the reason that most people hate the idea of going on stage or most people hate the idea of talking to camera is they hate what they sound like and look like. So if you can get over that and not care anymore, then you can go ahead and do it. And that means you can do it on stage. So what she's saying is get practice. The other thing I would say is don't do it in the car while you're driving to get your phone out. And because <laughs> that's how you crash your car. Because <laughs> when you listen back to it, you're going to hear, and now I was, ah! And that's not really a good you know, start to your broadcast, to be honest with you. Yeah, but the great thing is now she delivered three points uh, because one of the, 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 the what uh, many people want to do is they want to, compress so much and we have also been guilty of doing this just simply three points and that was it i mean the video itself so far is about uh, four minutes five minutes long and she has already done the three the three steps which are very uh, easy for us to follow and then we have to go into the very last step so let's break let's bring back amanda so that you can see actually how she closes the video have a look and if you do film this video and want to show someone, then go ahead and shoot me a DM on Instagram and I'd love to see it. Overall, you just have to have faith that you will eventually be super comfortable on camera. It just takes overcoming that resistance. So I hope you try out these techniques. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Instead of getting in front of the camera, well, I kind of said that in the intro, be able to feel blah, blah, blah brake and the accelerator, I guess the brake and the accelerator. See, I'm still struggling. <laughs> I said terrified so many times. I guess it doesn't matter. I need to stop overthinking it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's evidence of your mistakes. Brake, accelerator. I did it right the first time. Yeah. So close. So close. There we are. Putting it to bed with a call to action. Because if you built up that rapport of people and people are watching you and they're into it and so on, and when she says subscribe or she says then what you've got to do is this, it's like doing a presentation on stage. If you've been on stage for 45 minutes giving a keynote speech and then you just walk off without saying, find me on LinkedIn and Instagram or talk to me afterwards or if you want to swap business cards, see how we can do business together, you've had a massive opportunity to bond with people and you've left all the good stuff on stage and walked away leaving it there. So she, she kind of did a great job of, of sharing with people. I would never do a blooper reel, but mind you, today has been a complete blooper reel, so I can't say that really. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting to see how also some of the YouTubers are using these bloopers to show it. And I think this is a whole point about uh, what we are doing. Basically, just lose the fear, re relax, and have a, and have a, 
uh, a good time when actually you're being on camera. Now, what I, what I, um, just a couple of very fine distinctions on these last clip that we saw. First of all, she engages the audience by saying, well, you know, if you're going to be recording some of these clips, let us know, which is exactly the same thing as, for example, we were just talking a moment ago about uh, Frank and uh, his uh, Boston accent. And uh, here is Frank. <laughs> here is Frank telling us, well, brilliant advice. Uh, correct, uh, correct practice makes permanent. That's uh, that's great uh, advice, Frank. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much. So we're basically, you know, acknowledging the uh, the fact that he was there. That it is also uh, uh, Doctor Yes is also there, and we're also seeing a few other people uh, just also there g giving us some messages. And she says, well, you know, if you record these videos, please share them with us. So she's already engaging the audience. And at the very end, you see that she has the blooper reel, but the blooper reel is in something that in YouTube is called the end screen. So she's actually being pulled out. And then the other are the recommended videos, which for me was one of the biggest learning points in now that I've been really doing a lot of uh, YouTubing um, in, in, uh, in our channel. And uh, it is basically that, the whole thing of, of, uh, of recommending other of your content to people. Because if you don't recommend other of your content, people do not know that you have all this content and just people don't watch it. So now you know the formula. It's actually fairly simple. It's four steps. What do you think of this formula? That I was actually, I mean, isn't it amazing that this was recommended by Nina? It's so fascinating because when we grew up, which was many years ago, there's only black and white TV because actually life was in black and white. And um, the idea of the stuff... Of... <laughs> when I was already born and there was already color television. <laughs> okay, whatever, uh, son. Um, but I remember the, the stuff that we just shared on the TV there, on the show, is something that was only known to the very elite of programmers and the very elite of presenters who would go on and they'd be the voice of calm. And you would literally, if you got, if you had a chance to see them in person, your, your jaw would drop because you're going, wow, magic. But now this is able, this is available for anybody. Anybody can cr create a YouTube channel. Anybody can talk about anything. And it doesn't matter what age you are. And it's so sophisticatedly broken down that whatever the age of the person, like Maya and Nina, you know, nine and 10 years old, they can have a full on proper TV show knowing everything you'd have on TV. Now, here's where the challenge is why would you want to watch proper TV if you don't need that content? If you can just watch what you like from the many people doing it on YouTube, then that's where most people live. And for people like the age of a Generation Z, and for my daughter, she'll never have an interest in watching normal TV because it just doesn't work. But she'll have her own channel and she'll be on it. So did you enjoy this content that we just shared with you that I think it's awesome? We're going to be continuing with a lot of great content. So please support us by subscribing to our uh, YouTube channel. And now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sharing with you another great strategy on how you can grow your viewership and your subscriptions on YouTube. Um, between Dave and I, we have been really learning a lot on how YouTube works. And uh, sadly, many speakers don't really use YouTube as a way to communicate and to actually get their message across. And I believe it's super powerful if you start really crafting and creating your YouTube channel. One of the things that I enjoy the most out of doing this is that uh, every time that we go on air, whether it is on Fast Forward or whether it is on uh, the Toilet Paper Diaries, we are creating content for several things. So possibly, Dave, we can break it off. What is what we are doing with uh, all these episodes that we are creating from the Toilet Paper Diaries, from uh, Fast Forward, and uh, what is exactly what we're doing? Because I think they're going to find it fascinating. Yeah, it all comes down to creating evergreen content that people would be able to find from the search engines. So by creating a show like this, where it's all about presenting, and we break it up into certain pieces, those are all elements that people can watch at a later stage. And they're all going to be in bite-sized chunks that they can find what they need to. And of course, it leads back to the fact that myself and Ernesto have presented it. So from there, they're able to say, well, I like these guys, hopefully, and there I want to see more of their stuff. So there's a strategy underneath the strategy of creating a show like this. We don't just let it all fall out or put it together by accident. It's all carefully documented, isn't it, Ernesto? <laughs> oh, well, at least we try. 
But what is very nice is now you can see we have several segments that we cut, and it's very nice. I mean, if you go see in our YouTube channel, you will see that uh, we have a ton of content of stuff which is happening right now. We have educational content. We are providing a lot of content. So believe it or not, Dave and I are becoming YouTubers. Fantastic. I'll shave my head and I'll lose about 50 years. Fantastic. <laughs> so that is uh, that is exactly what we're doing and also the whole episode as soon as it is already chopped off it also becomes a podcast and this podcast goes to everywhere so every single thing that we are doing it just is perfectly crafted so that we start getting a very strong footprint on the internet which is exactly what we want to do we are building towards the future because uh, we have built communities. I mean, I have built communities in Facebook. I have built communities in um, uh, Instagram. And uh, you have been also building communities in, in uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. But these communities, even though they're, that they're great and we have a platform, one of the biggest difference with YouTube is that YouTube actually allows you to be found 10, 15, 20 years from now. You're still going to be there. So if you produce great content, you're footprint is going to be very strong and this is advice that we are getting from gary v is that right yeah but one of the one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet is a uh, consistency because today we had a mess up with the fact that my my computer locked and the internet went off but was it deliberate or not i don't know you have to look at no it wasn't um but we still carried on many people would just abandoned it started again because you wanted to look brilliant from the very beginning and that's the key to it consistency every day when we do a show we do it at the same time we finish around about the same kind of time and you know that when it comes to a monday wednesday and a thursday david and esther will be out there doing a show the continuity and the consistency is why people will stick with you even for people who are better than us at presenting they do one-offs if people can't find where they're coming next they're not even going to bother looking for them whereas we're average but we're always there and in your face and that's our strategy. Yeah, and, and what happens is our, our audience has been growing little by little. It's an exponential growth. And that's another of those things that you need to take into consideration. So basically doing a webinar here and there is not going to really help you as much as actually having this consistency that we're having. And that's why we wanted to share these last four points in how you can use YouTube to grow your viewers and to actually become a lot better. Have a look. If you're a speaker, an expert, or you have a business online and you have a YouTube channel and you would like to get more views to your videos, what I'm going to be sharing with you is going to be very useful. So please pay attention and take some notes. Right now, we are on the YouTube channel of one of our speakers, Frank Mulcahy. I was having a conversation with him this morning and he was telling me I would like to get more views and I would like to get more subscribers to my YouTube channel. And I saw that on the Fast Forward show, you were actually talking about to do that. So I really look forward to watch that video. So if you have seen that video make sure to subscribe on the toiletpaperdiaries.com so that you can actually get yourself to watch those videos so i'm going to give you some very easy to implement tips that you need to have on your youtube channel here we go so the first thing that i want you to notice is here it looks very nice i mean he has a very nice picture of him there he is as a picture that we took in the uh, world trade center in dubai and that's a nice picture it makes it look nice however he's not actually fulfilling the purpose of what you want in youtube let me tell you what i am talking about if you go to the website of uh, speak in Dubai or the YouTube channel of speak in Dubai what you're gonna see is that we have uh, the different logos of what we are doing we t we say here what this is all about and we have here the website where we want to send people to so as you can see all this makes a difference right away plus of course we are asking people to subscribe now when you change this of course immediately when people arrive they know oh okay i know what this is all about not only they see a picture of myself or uh, the uh, whatever it is and instantly they say okay i think this is interesting now the second thing that we can see is that i have here my most prominent video or the video which is going to be a welcome to my channel and here it starts going to start playing automatically when people arrive if we go to frank's 
website to Frank's channel, we can see that there's no video like that. So adding that video there is going to be very easy. And it is very easily done if you just go to the settings on your YouTube channel. Now, next thing that I want to show you is that he has a ton of videos, but hardly any of these videos has a thumbnail. So if I see him, that he, if I see a, this video, I am not compelled to actually click on the video. But if the thumbnail, which is the little picture, which is here, basically says what this video is about, there's a highly uh, likely possibility that someone or myself are going to click on it. Here, I'm not going to click because I do not know what the video is about. I don't want to waste time. So as you can see, if we go to another uh, channel, which of course has a ton of traffic and a lot of, and a lot of clicks, you can see that every single one of the videos that they have here has a thumbnail. Can you see? Use these signals. It makes you curious. It's compelling. Start doing this. It's compelling. Once again, he's using this. Start doing this. Start, start doing this. Don't say this. Can you see why this is uh, completely different to what we were uh, talking about a little bit earlier? Now, let's go back into uh, Frank's channel. If we click here in the video that he has the most uh, views, which is 1,200 views, we click here to the video and uh, we can see that he has a, a very, uh, this is his reel, it is fantastic, uh, we created, so of course we're very proud of that. But let me just show you a couple of things that you're going to find very interesting. If we go to the very end of the video, he has where he could be contacted. So Frank Mulcahy and he has here his website and he has his email and he has his telephone number. That's fine. But how can you improve views by having this? Well, just look at this here. There's nothing here and there's nothing here. Well, what should I be looking for? Let me show you. So let me bring you back to the Speak in Dubai channel, which by the way, please go see it at youtube.com forward slash speak in Dubai and please subscribe. That's going to be very useful for us. That's the way that you can support us. So let me just uh, click here on a random video. I mean, let's just, let me just, as you can see here in all the videos, I have thumbnails. Now let me just click on this random video. So just one of the random videos that we have. As you can see here, there's two elements that were not in Frank's website. That's the subscribe button and that's also the information cards button. Now, what happens if I click this button here? Look at this. It immediately recommends me other videos, which of course that makes it more compelling for people to keep on binge watching your channel. And look at this one. I have a, a subscribe button on every single one of my videos, which makes it easier for people to subscribe to your channel. Can you see how these two tips can really help you? Well, we're going to continue doing that on Wednesday episode of the Toilet Paper Diaries and also more in depth on how to improve your YouTube channel inside of Fast Forward. So make sure to go to toiletpaperdiaries.com and subscribe because this information is going to be very valuable for you. Monday, Wednesdays and Thursdays we broadcast, but on Mondays and Wednesdays it's the Toilet Paper Diaries. On Thursday, we've got a special guest and we go for a deep dive into how everything comes together to run your business. And also, we've got incredible tips and tricks and tools and techniques that we don't even share on this show. The only way you can do it is to go to the toiletpaperdiaries.com, which is our special website. Register there and you'll find out where to go and how to join us. So um, it's a very exclusive crowd, but the stuff that's on there and the guests we have are phenomenal. So make sure you join us on Fast Forward on a Thursday, not just the shows that we do on a Monday and Wednesday as well. Yeah, and also one very important uh, piece of news that I want to share with you. Yesterday, I was um, reading some information about what's how the world is going to start coming back to normal, as uh, we were talking earlier. I mean, we have been saying, well, you know, we all want to go out from our... Uh, homes and we have we want to get uh, back into normal but in reality it's going to be very uh, in, in different phases so right now for example right now all the the hairstyles that sorry the hairdressers are, are already open so next time possibly that you see me i'm going to be with a shorter hair that's going to be the first change don't and spoil uh, it. then restaurants don't spoil it keep the afro i love it okay so, so you, I mean, there's going to be restaurants, there's going to be a number of things in phases, 
But uh, I was actually very shocked to see that uh, theater plays, cinemas, sports events, uh, concerts, conferences, and events, which for us as speakers, as experts, uh, are incredibly uh, important. They were saying that it's going to be about two years before they are at least at 64 to 70%. So think about it. Do you think that you need to learn the skills that we are teaching you today? That's why you have to keep on watching the Toilet Paper Diaries and fast forward. Absolutely.